Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Kalika and you're gonna be a craftier person after watching this video. Brilliance in Marketing Around 1990, I was working for a tiny division of a huge computer company. Our business was to buy components like memory sticks and network cards from other manufacturers, put our company's name on them and sell them through computer retailers at an obscene profit. These were the days when a lot of people only trusted a name brand. Sales of a particular widget were slow, so one of the marketing wizards came up with a great idea. He set up a special deal with one of the large retailers. After 30 days, we would buy back any that they couldn't sell. Within a month, we were shipping cases of these widgets to every one of the retailer's stores. Management was delighted, and the marketing guy got a huge bonus. I happened to go into one of these stores to buy ink from my printer, and looked around for our product. Couldn't find it, so I asked one of the employees. He said he had never heard of the widget and showed me a similar product from another manufacturer. I said I really wanted our widget, could he please ask a manager? At this point I was assuming these widgets were flying off the shelf so fast they couldn't keep them in stock. The manager told me he did have some in the back room. If I really wanted one, it would take a while since he had to dig one out of the shipping crate. I asked why they weren't on the shelf. He said that the product was basically overpriced junk that no one wants. I thanked him and left. The next day, I reported this to my manager. We did some investigation and figured out what happened. Like every other manufacturer, we sold the product to the retailer at a wholesale price. The retailer then marked it up for retail sale. This special deal agreed to buy the widgets back, not at the wholesale price, but at the suggested retail price. The retailer was just following the terms of his contract. He bought the widgets from us for $100, let them sit in the corner of his storeroom for a month, then sold them back to us for $150, instant profit. My manager and I did what any loyal employee would do. We submitted a formal suggestion that we change the terms of the deal to buy them back at the wholesale price, thus saving the company thousands of dollars each month. We got a nice check for 10% of the first month's savings. Wow, what an insanely good incentive for a retailer to hold onto your product for 30 days for hundreds if not thousands of dollars worth of profit. I wonder why they didn't even attempt to put them on the shelves though, because it really was a win-win strategy. I don't understand how this equipment works, so here's what I'm going to tell you to do. So this time I'm talking about a boss I had in 2011. I'm stationed in Trenton, Ontario this time, and I'm working on a system called the MPN25, which is a mobile radar system which can be deployed, set up, and fully functional, at least on paper. The reality is a little different, but that's all tech stuff. Anywhere in the world in under 48 hours. You're going to need to understand two things to understand this story. First, power means precision approach radar, and it's in reference to the elevation of an aircraft. There are a lot of these little things called T slash R, transmit and receive modules, in the power array which interpret the radio wave the radar sends out so that I can tell how high an aircraft is. And by a lot, I mean somewhere in the range of 110 plus. I can't remember the exact number. The second thing you need to know about this radar is that the PAR isn't a moving part. It uses beams to register the target, so the TR modules are absolutely critical in determining where the aircraft is in relation to the ground. Okay, now that that's out of the way, we had an issue with some of the TR modules near the bottom of the power array, and when one of these modules dies, it tends to pull down the gain in the other modules around it, so troubleshooting to find out which module is the problem can be problematic. Or so I was taught. We're gonna come back to this. The boss had given me a speech when I arrived at the unit that the radar would take a year to get comfortable on before I knew what I was doing. Also, the radar is under warranty, so all we can do is pull boxes, no third line maintenance. As a qualified third line tech, box level fault finding is a joke, especially considering this is a giant radio and I just came from a place where I was the radio subject matter expert. I responded with, I'm looking forward to it boss, you should know that I'm an expert in radios though, so you'll be able to employ me on the radar much faster than that. His response stunned me. Radars have nothing to do with radios. For the record, radar is an acronym, it stands for Radio Detection and Ranging. So I'm brand new to the unit, and my supervisor doesn't understand the principles behind radar. Great. So remember the TR module problem? I realize my boss isn't going to be able to impart anything useful to me, so I start reading the radar books. Nothing new to learn here outside the software, since radars are essentially schizophrenic radios that are constantly screaming, WHAT THE HELL WAS THAT?! every single time it detects something in its sweep. I've read the manuals, I have some grounds for troubleshooting. I start by running what's called a max power calibration, all this does is run each TR model to load limit, and it shows you what kind of power they put out. Anything around, if I recall correctly, 100 decibels was considered good. 
Usually when a model busts, the final amplifier stage is the culprit and you'd see a return on max power calibrations that topped out around 60 to 80. That was a sign that the module needed to be replaced. I had gotten to work and was about to extract the 5 bad modules we had in the array when the boss comes strolling in. Now, in the power array there's over 100 of these little modules. Controlling each cluster of modules is an interface card, 5 total, connecting in series and parallel, and it's responsible for like 23 or 24 modules each. I suspect the problem with these modules is actually the interface card, because even though I've replaced the TR modules, the fault is still persistent. Again, I've already run a max power calibration. My boss suggests that I remove the connectors between interface cards, because if I don't, I'll blow up every TR module connected to the array. I disagree, because the manuals indicated that removing the ribbon cables also removes the alternate grounding paths, and an NS interface card will do exactly what he's saying if it already has a bad ground and no redundancy. He looks at me pointedly with that look parents give unruly kids and says, I've been here for four years, you need to remove the ribbon cables connecting the interface cards, don't argue with me. Finally we're on to malicious compliance time. Alright boss, your call, you're the supervisor, would you mind being the one to run the call? I'm not comfortable doing something I think will destroy the array, I responded. Sure, he snapped out, confident in his knowledge, but be ready to apologise when you're wrong. He runs a max power calibration with the interface cards not linked. Lo and behold, the bottom 20 something TR modules linked to the IC5 fry. Reportedly, these cost around $11,000 each, making this fault somewhere in the quarter million dollar range. He left the radar building so I could fix the fried array, and about an hour later, the power array was up and running, with over half of our spare modules used to repair it. This is what happens when bosses think they're better than their employees. Sure, the guy had 4 years of experience, but OP was an expert in similar technology. He identified a problem, did his research on how to fix it, and the boss just kind of brute forces it and destroys hundreds of thousands worth of dollars of equipment. Nice. Renegotiating overtime after the fact, work to rule leads to a raise. It seems that a great deal of my most entertaining tales come from the fallout of my employers trying to stiff me. This is another overtime related post. No TLDR, if it's too long, I guess you should pass. I work for a construction contractor, and at the time of this event I've been with him for a few years. The team is fairly small, I doubt there was more than a dozen of us in the department including guys on the tools. The department tended to run lean, so we were often a little overloaded, but we rarely had to lay people off during quiet periods. At this point in my working life I have earned a reputation for being good with customers, even the difficult ones, safe installs and finding a way to get it done. There's the background of the business. We're swapping out the power supply to a plant, but the plant can't be turned off except for very short switchovers, think 1R tops. If this plant goes down, we and the client are looking at massive fines from pollution events, and we're transferring it off the grid onto generators. While the plant is on generator power, we have to rip out the old gear and put in a foundation for the new gear, install the enclosure over the new gear, joint up the power cables, test and put everything back to safe before switching back to the mains power. The client is extremely caution and risk averse, and rightly so when you're dealing with 11 kVA power. The client rep is in charge of high voltage is extremely fastidious to details and will not sign off on work without it being to their satisfaction, also rightly so. This is the background to the project. The project manager briefs me on the job, I look at the scope and the plans and go away for an hour to work out what I need to make this work given the program of 2 weeks. 1 week setup, 1 week install and switch back. I go back to the project manager and tell him this is going to take a crap ton of hours in the first week to make sure that this goes off flawlessly or we will lose our shirt on the generators going over the allowed hire period. I don't want time, I want the cash, I'm not being greedy, flat rate overtime is fine. Note my contracted hours are a little less than the standard 40 hour week. He agrees, don't worry, we'll sort it out in the end. Yeah okay. The project starts, I am first on site, last off site, everything is progressing. Things are on track, testing is done, it's looking good for the switchover, but suddenly there's a problem. The client's HV rep is not happy with the generators, they're not set up as he understood them to be, client rep is about to pull the plug. I explained to the client rep that he's correct, they are not what he was expecting, they're better. This generator setup is twice as reliable as the system he was expecting. Fortunately, I have figures to show this from monitoring over the several days we've been running them on test. The client is happy. The train is still on the tracks and we proceed onto the weekend ready for the install the following week. At this point I have 80 hours into that week and I'm paid for 40. 40 hours OT, right? We shall see. The next week we proceed with the install. Goes fine. No bumps to derail us. We actually finish early and make more profit. Generators are gone 2 days early. Note, these generators cost per day what I make in a month. 
Reason to be happy, right? Well, everyone is until the following week. Now we get to the start of the not subtle at all malicious compliance. The project manager is absent and I have to line up my timesheets, mileage and other admin along with my overtime. So I go to the general manager with it and describe the conversation with project manager to him. Nothing in writing at this point. Yeah, I didn't make that mistake again. General manager is not going to give me the 40 hours of overtime. He wants to do time in lieu. Yes, I'm pissed and argue I'm not getting anywhere so I can see to a week's time in lieu. Better than nothing, right? General manager says, you can have two days. To say that my displeasure was expansive was an understatement. The office went silent with the cursing I threw at the general manager. I told him where he could shove his two days and left, went home. As long as I get my 40, my time is flexible. The following day, the project manager approaches me and asks to speak to me outside. He's disappointed with my attitude over this. Yeah, that was the wrong opener. So now I cursed him out. Point out that the amount of unpaid overtime they have the staff doing equates to two full-time positions and you know what? F you. From this point on I'll do the hours on my contract and that's it. I will work to an effing stopwatch and the second that it ticks over to R40 I'm gone and the job can go to hell. You know, work to rule. Here's the malicious compliance. My contract hours are 38 per week. I have no problem doing 40 at work to cover lunch even though I work through. However, on site we run 10 hour days 5 days a week. I've been doing that 10 hours a week as unpaid overtime without making any issue of it on the understanding that if we have quiet weeks we slope off early and it balances out. I mentioned earlier that we run lean. Related to that we have multiple roles. I'm an engineer but I can also tender, project manage and run the installs on site. In the UK you need specific qualifications to run sites. Out of the dozen department employees, three of us had that qualification. So if I bail at hour 40, that's Thursday afternoon. Who looks after Friday? What about the wasted plant hire? The men standing? There's no one available to cover this. We run lean. They have their own projects. But it gets worse. When driving to the office, the mileage is commuting, and that's your own time. But driving to site is on behalf of the business, and it's paid for by the business. At least the fuel is. But we never claimed that time. We treated it as commuting, even though it isn't. So now I have somewhere between half an hour to an hour each way that adds to my timesheet. Let's be generous and average it out to three hours a day. That's 13 hours per day. 39 hours by the end of Wednesday. I barely have time to get to work on Thursday before I run out of hours so that's two days a week that the site is down. Or we can shorten the working day perhaps to get five days in, yeah? Yeah, get ready to be hit with a crap ton of early warnings from subcontractors and extended programs from working a five hour day instead of a 10 hour day. This is what I left the project manager with. Oh, and I said, bollocks to this, I'm going home. Yeah, starting to get a bit of time to make up here. So a couple of days go by with me seething in the office, closing out the last job and setting the next one up. Immediate managers are avoiding approaching me. It's all a bit eggshells. Well, it turns out that the project manager and the general manager had been crunching the numbers. I had made out like a bandit on the last project, even with an extra week of my time on it. Huge margin, due to clearing the hired kit early. Also, they realised that they'd just pissed off one of their most effective go-to staff members. The general manager walks quietly up to my desk and asks for a word in one of the empty offices. I'm expecting a dressing down and I'm ready to come out swinging. F the job, I can fall into another company within a week during that economy with my experience and qualifications. General manager has spoken to the project manager about the situation and I'm getting a 3 grand raise, which was a hell of a lot more than a week's OT. I said, that'll do I suppose, cheers. I have never heard of someone in my sphere raging on a boss and coming away from it with a raise. Hope you enjoyed it, looking forward to the feedback. Okay, so that's all for r slash malicious compliance. I really hope you did enjoy it. As always, if you do want to see more content like this, then please do subscribe. My Twitter, Discord and Patreon links are in the description, and any support is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for watching!